Okay. Welcome everybody to, this is now July, um, hopefully the last of the uh, full meetings on Zoom and uh, in our next meeting, hopefully we'll find a way to continue the Zoom because we have a lot of members now, or a number of members who uh, live fairly far away. Um, the, the furthest member uh, lives in London but uh, as soon as Andy goes ahead and moves to Paris, then he will have the distinction of living further away uh, from the <laughs> club and having a hard time to drive to uh, Thunderstruck Motors. <laughs> Back in context. Okay, whoops, there we go. Up uh, the regular meeting schedule and hopefully Tanya has the right link and if she doesn't we'll have to find a way to give her a telephone call and get her the right link. I sent her another message. So we'll start as we always do with introductions of who you are and how you get around. I'm Jerry Glaser, uh, current president of the NBAA uh, and uh, uh, for another nine months and then we'll get our vice president to be president. Uh, Alan is not here with us yet. He said he was going to try to make this meeting, uh, our, our president emeritus. And I am still driving my Nissan LEAF 2018. And I have all of the notes from the uh, leasing agent and the dealer saying, you only have 45 days left. What are you going to do? And if people have advice, uh, other than I'm not getting a Tesla because everybody else has Teslas, mm -hmm. uh, I want to get something different. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to hear what everybody has to say. So, John, on my screen, you're number two. And you're on mute. Oh, what? I thought I already muted myself. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I unmuted my unmute. Um, yeah, so I'm John Palmerly. Um, drive a Geo Metro that has a leaf motor in it every day and uh, doing, hopefully, doing some upgrades on that to use a new product that we have at Thunderstruck, but at this point, everything's, it's, it's great. I just charge every couple of weeks. And uh, that means that this battery pack that was built in 2008 will probably live until before, until my death. <laughs> it's just, when you got a big pack and it charges every two weeks, you know, you, you all I have to do is say, well, if, if I have a thousand more charges, that's a lot of weeks. So, anyway, happy with that. Uh, next on my screen is Dave Heacock, who always comes in early, and that's how I know whether I've set this up correctly or not, and you weren't there. <laughs> of course, a habit from a lot of years working. Um, I'm Dave Heacock. Uh, my electric Havana is uh, currently under renovation, so I'm driving my wife's 2007 Saturn hybrid and uh, I watch different car shows and I'm always amazed at 2021 cars that get way worse gas mileage than a 2007 Saturn hybrid. I mean, I, I put a special unit on it and I, and I can get 25 miles per gallon with it pretty easily. It's an, and it's a much older car, so, but in the meantime. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's the bad part. A standard gas car that I had back in 1973 got 30 miles yeah. per gallon. So it's <laughs> crazy. All right, Zeno, you're up next. Uh, and you're trying yeah. to impress us all with your books. I know that. You're in the um, dining room. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm Zeno Sweating. I live in Sebastopol. Uh, I have a Honda hybrid. It makes. Uh, 57 miles a gallon. It uh, used to be 67 miles a gallon, but it's, uh, I think, 12 or 13 years old. So I'm slowly moving, uh, thinking about going electric. Um, and one incentive I have is that my gas stove uh, stopped, half of it stopped working. And I'm being told that they don't have a replacement, something, something, some kind of electronic gadget that sits in there and they cannot repair it. So I'm practicing cooking my dinners with two uh, burners um, and I have this event coming up. And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking around. I talked to Gary about how can I electrify my house? I need to maybe four 
220 uh, outlets, uh, that kind of thing. So I'm working on it. I also have a bicycle and I try to use that in turn. All right, Brad, you're up. Hi, yeah, I'm Brad Morrison. Uh, I get around mostly uh, by bike or walking or the bus, but I also have a 2004 Honda Civic Hybrid that I'd hopefully like to replace someday with an electric vehicle. Lowell, good to see your face. We haven't seen uh, you. Yes, uh, I still have my, uh, my, my Tesla 2014 Tesla Model S. That's how I mostly get around. Uh, and uh, recently took it back and forth to Yosemite and it still appears to be just as good as it was uh, new as far as I can tell. It has, uh, a, a, from all appearances, the same range and, uh, and is performing, I think, uh, without any noticeable diminished uh, uh, capacities. So I'm very happy with that. The Leaf, on the other hand, is, is, is definitely uh, you know, losing some of its range. And um, and it and it and it is remarkably uh, remarkably how quickly if I, when I do drive it, 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 it you know I, I, I lose miles much more much more quickly than I would expect to actually. So um, what year is uh, that? What what year is your leaf? Uh, it's uh, the 2013. So it is it is uh, you know uh, fairly old and it has a has one of the it does it does not have the uh, upgraded batteries. Oh, it doesn't. Um, okay. I saw something about being able to re replace your battery pack on, on leaves now. So, you know, it, it might be worth it. Uh, but I probably will trade the leaf out at some point. Uh, it's nice to have two cars. Um, I do have a pickup truck, but I, I uh, with a gas powered pickup truck, a uh, uh, Toyota Tacoma, but, you know, actually don't drive it at all and uh, would like to either sell it or get rid of it. I mean, in some way, because I have feel I feel a little bit bad about keeping a gas a gasoline car on the road and handing it to somebody else because uh, that that little pickup truck has got another hundred thousand miles in it <laughs> if i if someone else owns it and fixes it up a little bit uh, it'll get a it, it'll you know it'll be around for a while and maybe it's my responsibility to make sure it isn't <laughs> uh anyway and i do ride a bike but i don't ride a bike for practical purposes i ride a bike for exercise so when, when you say that, it's something that occurred to me as a project for the club, which we've never talked about anything like this, would be to uh, convert a pickup to electric, make it the club pickup. And for all of us who think that we need to own a pickup for the five times a year that you're going to carry something around, we could go pick up the pickup. Maybe we can park it at Thunder Thunderstruck. Yes, uh, I mean that, that's you know it's the reason I have the pickup. I have two acres of land. I need to get uh, to take trash away sometimes. I need to bring compost and 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 and, and uh, mulch in sometimes, very you know very infrequently you know once or twice a year. So I have this pickup for that purpose. I could easily uh, uh, my my neighbor has a has a has a leaf and and is is tows a trailer with it. Tows a tows a utility trailer with. It. And uh, I do have a hitch on for the for my uh, for my bike rack, so I just need to get the elect electricity in there to to make it you know so I can have brakes and, and, and that kind of thing and and then you know buy a small or modest sized trailer and uh, and and that you particular need could be uh, satisfied. I, I may do that too. Uh, Woody, you're up next. Are you done crunching? <laughs> yes, I am. Oh my gosh, I just realized I was not on mute. Anyway, Woody Hastings, I drive uh, still. When I get around, I don't get around much. Uh, 2013, the Volt with a V. Okay, or, or is June driving that most of the time? Um, yeah. She, yeah, June drives it most of the time. Yeah. Uh, Sonia. Everybody. Um... Yeah, we still just have the Model 3 and the Chevy Volt, the 2014 Volt, and uh, we're speculating whether we could run the Volt for another seven years as kind of like, you know, the second car that's kind of handy to have. And um, on occasion, we need to run to the dump and stuff like that. So I really like that idea of a group electric pickup. That would be kind of cool. Well, let's talk um, about that at some point. I'd like to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'd be happy to donate my pickup. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, and one more thing, we're we're just uh, talking with an electrician and uh, a, a heat pump specialist about putting a heat pump in because 
um, our gas wall heaters so loud and mm -hmm. decided of all the things to convert it'd be the first, the next, the next to convert. And uh, um, if anyone has, you know, an opinion about um, brands or um, features, please let me know in the chat and um, uh, I'll let you know how that goes. Maybe I can do a presentation on it. Well, it, uh, you might talk to Tor and Steve and me about that because we've had a presentation by um, an expert who does electrification of projects and there's a bunch of different options available and I'm not I I'm about to do the same thing in two places and I'm trying to use the except they never answer the phone a company that June works for uh, <laughs> and yeah. uh, uh, I have two uh, heating things so maybe we should talk I, I, I want to figure out the answers too uh, yeah. Dave Harris. Uh, yes, good morning. Um, we have a 2020 leaf uh, on a two year lease. It is our fourth leaf. Uh, we just drove it down to Monterey Bay to make our periodic trip to the aquarium. And uh, it's got a 40 kilowatt battery. So we've uh -huh. charged a few times coming and going. Uh, I'm still puzzled though, our 2011, the first one, my wife drove it primarily and got an average of about 4.2 miles per kilowatt hour. This one, we're only getting 3.7. And I don't know, have we gotten uh, more of a lead foot or what is the reason that we're not getting uh, miles? I have an answer for that because uh, my wife doesn't drive our car, our 2018, all that often. She's often in the Prius, but when she drives the 2018 Leaf, uh, she gets between 4.5 and 5.0 miles per kilowatt hour. And I get in and, and I'm always getting 3.5 uh, to four. So I don't know what it is that she does. Uh, and uh, she says she just uses D, D mode. I use B modes. I've gone back to D to see how that works out. Uh, but I, I don't think it's the, I don't think it's the car. Right? I think it's the driver. Uh, Bernie. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, nothing's changed with me. I'm still got my two electric cars. Uh, all electric house and collectors on the roof. And I am planning a trip to Colorado, our, one of our, our first big outing uh, since the pandemic. And, uh, and I've been on uh, what a, a better route planner uh, app. And, and my model three is gonna cost, it's gonna cost according to that route planner, it's gonna cost the trip one way, it costs $70 to get to uh, Denver and uh, that's uh, six cents a mile. So, uh, and of course there's no, I have yet to spend a cent on maintenance. So uh, it's a 2018. So uh, I'm pretty pleased. Cool. Uh, Lawrence, and you really are in Palo Alto, huh? Oh, you're on mute, you're on mute. Okay, hear me now? Yeah. Great. So Jerry, one suggestion is if you take down your screen sharing, we can see the speaker bigger. I'm on an iPad, so I can't oh, do it otherwise. Okay, just a second. I, I'll do exactly that. Um, Not that you want to see me any bigger, but uh, yeah, I'm in Palo Alto. Um, and I frequently drive my girlfriend's 2019 Volt. And we've got a fair bit of experience with how to charge that with a 100 foot cord from the garage in the back while it's on the street um, using the original uh, power set that came with the car. You know, it's, oh, you're, that's interesting. Jerry, you're still highlighted as if you're the speaker. Anyways, yeah, you're the big picture. It's got a green square around it. Mm. I don't know if that's the same for everyone else, but uh, in any case, so we've got this innovative charge setup. We get 11 miles per hour charge um, by charging from a 240 volt outlet with the 120 volt charge cord that came with the car. Um, turns out the Clipper Creek innards allow it. So that's kind of fun. We occasionally go on long trips, drive to LA or up to Klamath and back. On the Klamath trips, we've tra traveled with a uh, level two charger borrowed from a friend so we could uh, fill up at RV parks. Um, because in some cases it's a long way between the fast chargers and if one's down, you're really stuck. Um, and that actually the level two charger came in quite handy at the campground where we stayed. So we could go and do day stuff and charge up overnight without having to run to town to charge. So I highly recommend it. We also try travel with a Tesla tap, which we've never needed to use, but it's nice to have the destination chargers you find here, there and everywhere. 
I'm super happy with the Bolt, although I do suggest for people who want to do long trips that they get a Tesla because the charging experience is much more seamless and less uh, angsty um, for my conversations with Tesla drivers. Uh, I have a question. Why, why join the North Bay chapter as opposed to the one that's close to you? I used to belong to the chapter down there. Well, chapter. best I can tell, they aren't doing anything right now. I've sent some emails and whatnot, got on the website, and everything looks like it died when COVID started. Um, uh -huh. Actually, I'm most involved in the Vancouver Electric Vehicle Association meetings. We have two a week, and I hang out with them all the time uh, for about four hours a week between the two meetings. Um, so it's just a way for me to be involved with people, people who are interested and bounce ideas off folks and share ideas and you know, up in Vancouver, the big deal is a lot of people live in apartment buildings and getting charging available for them is real tough. Um, and most EV drivers down here seem to be living in single family residences and like we're in a rental. And in order to, to put a charger in on the driveway, you probably have to replace the, uh, the breaker box from 100 amp service to 200 amp and, you know, landlord, could they be bothered, et cetera. So you know, my, my shtick is kind of helping people who don't have the resources to do major modifications to figure it out around the edges. Like we run our court across the uh, sidewalk and I built a wood ramp. It's about three quarters of an inch tall to get the skateboarders over it without them wiping out. So no one complains. You know, for a while we had a wire going from the house or from the, actually from the VW van over the sidewalk to a magnolia tree down the tree to the car. But uh, that proved difficult when there was wind storms and People tried to steal the cover off the van and cut through the cord. Anyways. Yeah, um, you know, so in every city that I've been in so far, uh, one of the things that we spend a lot of time talking about is uh, how we handle uh, rentals and, and make sure everybody has a chance to charge. Tor, you're up. Hey, uh, so we're, we traded in the 2017 Bolt for a 2020, got a good deal in Novato. I just recommend... <clears throat> getting multiple quotes when you for leases when you start shopping for because there was a almost $200 difference per month between the Santa Rosa wow. and the deal so don't assume all Chevy dealers are the same or whatever brand you decide to shop for um yeah we just took a trip up to up to Quincy and discovered Electrify America was across the country was offering free charging at all their uh, chargers last weekend that was a nice surprise but um and then one thing cool we said oh I, I ride a bike mostly but uh one thing we call cool we saw in a, the little fourth of july parade up there in the mountains was um a bolt with a hitch towing an old stagecoach so uh that was the highlight of uh, <laughs> for me in that parade it might be something we do for offer up to local parades that you know, like the Apple Blossom Parade or some others that get going again in the, in the next year. Um, yeah, thanks. All right, Cecilia, you're up. Hi, I'm Cecilia. I drive a 2018 Model 3. Um, I also recently got to do a little road trip. It was nice to get out and like go a place and it wasn't too bad, except it was really hot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's happening, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it was like 117 degrees. It's like the highest I saw my my car um, temperature. Hey, a uh, uh, question. Have you and Lowell and, and Mike had any opportunity? I know Mike's not here today. Uh, had an opportunity to um, talk more about moving the, the web? Not not yet, not yet. Okay. That, is, that is on my to-do list. Okay, very good. Steve, uh, welcome. And by the way, you can join the club besides just showing up for a meeting. It uh, didn't cost uh, you anything. <laughs> I was first time here and... We drive a 2015 Leaf and mainly get around by walking. I'm lucky enough to just work here in, in town in Sebastopol. So that's my commute mainly. And one thing that's a little different is that I share a truck with a neighbor and that's worked out really well. So opportunities to do that kind of car sharing experience with neighbors, I'd recommend it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay, Dale. Uh, Dale, you're, you have no video and you're on mute. So I can't tell if you're talking or if you heard. All right, we'll move from Dale over to Ben. 
Hi guys, Ben Peters here, Petaluma resident, waiting for my uh, new model uh, basic Kia Nero to show up. So it's in uh, transit, so still waiting on that, but excited to finally get that. All right, very good. And that is, did I get everybody? Anybody else uh, missing? Okay. Uh, to chapter business, um, not much has changed. Uh, we've had a couple of new members join uh, uh, recently, and uh, one of the newest ones didn't show up today. I, I sent uh, her a link, and numbers were renewed. So the numbers here probably are not exactly right, and I don't know. We haven't checked yet to see what our balance is, but I'm sure it's more than $6,130 at this point. Um, you'll get a note at the end of the meeting uh, that kind of looks like this. Uh, and if you see news that you want reported, you think can be reported, um, send that off. Uh, just reply to, directly to this uh, with a link and maybe why that's interesting news and what you think ought to be covered in it. And then we use that for putting the program together. Next speaker uh, it may end up being me again, only because we don't have another next speaker. And if somebody else has a next speaker who's more interesting than I am, which is not too hard, uh, uh, we'll uh, book that person. Uh, so keep an idea, uh, idea of what you might like to see uh, um, talks on. Also, um, Alan's done a number, Sonia's done, uh, Cecilia's done talks, Andy's done talks. Um, and in fact, the Lowell once said, boy, it would be great to have a talk on batteries. So I, I researched batteries. Woody gave a talk. Um, uh, researched batteries uh, for about a month, and I put a presentation together on that. So if you're interested in a topic also, and you want to present it, that would be great. So think about doing that too. Uh, last, uh, last month, uh, Zeno closed off his uh, discussion on, and I know I have the title wrong again, Zeno because uh, you didn't send me the slides uh, on urban mobility and questions about uh, how we get around. And we had a discussion on that. And there's links to both the presentation and to the videos. Uh, we had a request from Beverly Dish. I don't know how to say it, Deschal. I know um, her, yeah, it's Beverly Deschal. Deschal, okay. Uh, from down the Central Coast, and uh, Beverly wanted to know if a number of groups want to get together for initiatives uh, that we work on um, uh, across the state uh, as a larger group. Uh, this is through a Facebook group right now. I'm not a Facebook user, so uh, uh, if somebody else wants to initiate uh, contact, I did write back and say uh, we were looking for things to do. We we'd be interested in having a discussion, but she never responded back. Uh, you know her fairly well, Woody? I or do, just... yeah. Yeah, I was just on the phone with her yesterday, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I know okay. her pretty well. Uh, do, um, do you maybe to... you, can, you can open that up and find out where she's going with it. Sure, I'll put a note to self to ping her, sure. Okay, great. EB events, and by the way, don't go off of mute. <laughs> it's you. Oh, oh what, me? Yeah. What's the uh, question? So, it's not a question. Uh, Woody, we were inviting you to to kind of talk about the Monday, July 12th. Um, oh, 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 yeah, right, right, right. Okay, sure. So this is really cool because, uh, you know, the whole issue that I've been working on for a couple of years now, uh, construction of new gas stations in Sonoma County, um, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, we've been working with Mark Landman and Step Mark Landman, uh, city council member of Katati, also board member of the Regional Climate Protection Authority. For those of you, I know there's a couple of people at, at least out of, from out of the county here. We have an unusual county level agency that coordinates our climate uh, GHG reduction goals, the Regional Climate Protection Authority. It's made up, it's a JPA made up of, it's a joint powers agency made up of all the local governments in the county. And they are taking up this issue uh, of, um, but what they're planning to do on Monday, the 12th, at their meeting at 2.30, is a first discussion inviting the board members, all the city council members and the county representatives to offer input into what a 
a local government ordinance prohibiting new gas stations should look like. Um, we're urging that it be kept very simply, mostly about just prohibiting the construction of new gas stations. There's always mission creep with these kind of things and people want to add in stuff, but it gets complicated and then it's risks getting going sideways because you've tried to do too much. It's, it's really, we need to stop building new gas stations. That will, that's what we're pushing for. So it's an initial discussion on the 12th and then in, they skip August and then in September, they're planning to have a resolution that they will uh, opt on, on September 13th, I think is the date basically offering guidance and options and whatnot for uh, the cities in the county, the nine city, uh, well, not nine, it's eight because Petaluma has already done this. Yay, Petaluma. Um, and uh, uh, so for the eight cities and the county itself to look at you know, how to craft and what kind of whereas is and what kind of therefores you'd wanna do. And it does get a little tricky because each each local government has its own existing code and there's some you know, nuances and things they need to do to make sure that everything is consistent throughout their, their existing code. So yes, uh, that's what's going on there. I hope I covered the main points and happy to answer any questions about it. No questions? And, and let, let me just say this, we're the Congress coalition imposing new gas stations as so this, because it's starting to get some real traction and attention, we're working on putting together, we've got a contact list of about a thousand people from when we were collecting petitions back before COVID out at you know, farmers markets, tabling and whatnot. So we're gonna be reaching out and you know wherever you live in Sonoma County, whatever city you're at, um, we're trying to put together sort of strike teams in each city that would be working with their city councils to move this forward. So um, I may be reaching out to some of you because yeah, um, that, you know, we want to have people that care about this stuff uh, moving it. So that's pretty much it. So, so I, have, I have a question. Question? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we talked about this before, but I wonder whether you have any new insights in uh, the economics <laughs> of a gas station. Why do people um, still want to build them? Uh, what's, uh, what's the margins? There's the little store that goes with it. Um, do we understand the economics of the gas station? Sure, uh, we, we've looked at that quite a bit and that's a longer conversation. I think that would be something we'd probably want to, if we wanted to have a conversation about that, that would need to be an agenda item where we've carved out some time because there's a lot to say about that and, and we don't really have time here and now. Bottom line is the margin on the gasoline is very, very slim. Small. They don't yeah. really make their money on the gas. They make it on the Doritos and the beer and the rest of it um, or the car washes. So um, that's how that works um, basically. But the, but the real threat and why we've been pushing this is that what's the dynamics, gas stations have been dwindling, the old mom and pops disappearing over the last three decades. And it's these massive Costco, Safeway, mega gas, 16 pump, 24 pump gas stations with, you know, that's attached to some kind of uh, Costco or Safeway or what have you. Uh, uh, and that's what's sort of, of coming in and, and, and sweeping up uh, and having this discount gas so that people are going into the Costco or Safeway or whatever. And so we don't want to see proposals like that that we have to battle. We want to put, put a stop to it now. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's it. But yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you offline, Zeno, or um, have it on an agenda if people do want to talk about that. So if, about, you, if, you want, Bruce, if you want to- I'm sorry that it took so long to let you back in. I turned the waiting room off for some reason. I don't know why it was turned on, but uh, so we have to keep our eyes open to make sure, John, make sure we admit people that uh, pop up because we want Tanya to show up to give the talk. Just just to clarify, so when you enable the waiting room? I disabled that it. it. That, I disabled it. I know, but what does enable mean then? <laughs> well, enable says that if you put the waiting room in, they can wait and then you would admit them. Because I was, we were having to do that already. Yeah, well, here's Tanya, luckily. 
Okay. Yeah, well, I know. I turned it. I I basically disabled the waiting room a little while ago to make sure that we wouldn't have that problem, but it, it didn't take. So this is not my best Zoom day. Tanya, I'm glad you found your way here. Uh, we're just about to go into our news, so you'll be up right after that. And let me move into news. <laughs> um. Oh, by the way. Sonia put the the deck together this this time around. So uh, if there's if there's detailed questions, you have to ask her, not me. Um, <laughs> uh, so the GM has been pushing their skateboard solution, uh, and that's their platform now for all of the the GM vehicles that'll be coming out um, for a wide range of different vehicles. Uh, there's a video link that. Uh, uh, Sonia's included here to, to show what they're doing with this. One of the things that I found in my reading is this. Um, Volkswagen also has a standard that they have now introduced, which is their battery platform standard, which they are hoping every manufacturer of vehicles will use their battery platform standard. So the formats will be the same, kind of like 12 volt batteries. Um, and uh, then Tesla just finished announcing, and I think, uh, Sonia, did you add the link of that last link I sent to you? I didn't. Um, you didn't, okay. We'll yeah. do that next time. Uh, but there's a, a interesting link where um, um, Musk is talking about, well, cars should actually use the batteries at, at, always as an integral part of the, of the structure. We figured that out because, hey, we put the fuel in the wings of an airplane for a reason to make it an in, in, integral part of the, the structure. So you have three different uh, orientations on that that have been showing up. Would well, you want to talk about this, Sonia? Yeah. yeah, sure. <laughs> so, um, you know, each each of the car companies has been making their announcements. They're a little bit difficult to compare to each other, but Honda's made their announcement that they will make all EVs or fuel cell vehicles by 2040. Um, and that will include all of their motorcycles. So I thought that was kind of the more interesting thing about Honda in general. Um, they didn't talk about their generators. You know, here in California, if you go get a generator, you know, you have a lot of Honda options that are gas generators. Mm. Um, but I would kind of assume that they're really looking to get out of the, the um, gas engine manufacturing space fully. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a bold statement for Honda, but they, you know, um, haven't been as big as they were in the past. And, you know, maybe they kind of see a, a, you know, a smoother path forward this way. Um, so uh, they also have um, a joint venture going on right now where they will use GM's Ultium batteries in 2024. So I guess that that's their path to getting um, to a jump start before that they you know get into their own kind of a um, battery manufacturing or something like that. Um, so a, a lot of announcement, not a lot of detail yet, but um, partnerships. So we're just starting to see this this stuff come forward. Sure. And then Jerry, if you want, I can talk to this one too. Yeah, why don't you do that? Because yeah. otherwise I put my glasses on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of an interesting one. You know, um, Porsche just announced that they're going to open a performance battery factory um, that will be really specific. And I thought some people on the call might know kind of where they're going with this. They're um, going to be creating batteries that will use silicone an anodes. Um, and they use some silicone uh, today in the Taycan or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but this will be uh, kind of a larger mixture of this so that it can run much hotter for faster charging and faster driving. Um, uh, but they won't be particularly great in below freezing conditions. So we won't be seeing these out in the road. And um, you know, uh, the good question here might be like, how will this benefit us as regular drivers who care more about um, the environment? Um, and uh, I don't know the answer to that, but you know, if anyone has some input on that, that would be interesting. I just thought 
gee, they're gonna be doing something completely different at kind of a smaller scale, but each experiment like this could possibly lead to you know, new understandings that we don't have today. That's where I was gonna jump in. If you look back a hundred years and you see what was happening with automobiles a hundred years ago with gasoline engines, the place where the types of engines that we have and the techniques that we have in our engines um, that made them more efficient, made them higher performance, came out of racetracks. And they were totally, made no sense whatsoever, but then what they, they proved them in racing and then found ways to do it. The silicon is interesting, and I have to thank Lowell for, John, you wanna say something there? You go ahead, I, you're okay. maybe saying what I'm gonna say. <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, I wanna thank Lowell for asking that question about batteries, because he's forced me now into a two year uh, reading things about batteries, going to all the storage X. And I've learned why silicon is important. I also learned why silicon was a problem, um, was that I didn't realize how the, the ions move back and forth. And uh, when the ions move back and forth in the batteries, when they uh, basically find their way over to the anode side, uh, what they're really doing is they're not combining chemically, they're finding a place to hide in the structure. Well, it turns out uh, with silicon compared to graphite, there's a lot of better places to hide. And so the ions get in there and hide really well and really fast. So you can charge them fast and they can hold more ions, et cetera. But the problem is they're so good at this, it expands the material by 4X. And so mechanically, there's a problem with it. And every one of the manufacturers has been doping their uh, graphite now with more silicon so they can find more places for the ions to hide, hoping that the expansion uh, will be solved. There's a, a bunch of research on different techniques to see if we can find ways to use silicon. It's one of the many things that have been looked at for, uh, for batteries as to how to make them more efficient and charge faster. John, you wanna jump in? Well, yeah, that is what I was gonna talk about, but the, the, some of the details are really interesting and um, companies like VW that's starting to use um, uh, quantum computing or, or the plans to use quantum computing to develop new methods will actually do some random uh, experimentation on the computer side to determine the shapes of, of the nanostructure of, of a silicon uh, anode. It's pretty exciting. So yeah, like you're saying, when it goes into the racing field, um, you may get, we may get some results that will trickle down. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also wanted to comment about the last slide, um, just from an efficiency perspective, because I'm really into efficiency. If you can go back one. Yeah. Um, I just, I'm just really interested in, you know, when you see rounded shapes uh, like this, it's it's a really good thing. Also notice the rear view mirror is, is a camera. A camera. Yeah. And we've got to see that coming out and in, in being allowed. It, it isn't permitted yet, I guess, but. Yeah that kind of thing can really Im improve uh, efficiency. Also, you'll look at the, the rear wheels, they still are not covering up the rear wheels with, with a, an aerodynamic cover, which to me is just kind of funny. I, I don't understand. So as soon as you see that, then you'll know that <laughs> somebody's really trying <laughs> to, get, to get it efficient, but that, yeah, that yeah. kind of kills me because there's really no reason not to cover that up except for stylistic reasons. Uh, yeah. Zeno's car has the, has the cover. Yeah. Uh, and the Aptera was the first vehicle that I saw uh, 10 years ago that said, hey, why are we using mirrors? We should use cameras. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you want to talk about this, Sonia? Because after I saw this one and I was looking at both vehicles, I went and started reading more about them. Great. Well, yes. Yeah, so just the intro is that um, Car and Driver did a little article about the VW ID4 versus the Kia Niro EV. And um, they decided to give um, kind of a friendly head-to-head -head comparison, you know, win-loss situation where they 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 gave the 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 winning badge to um, the VW ID4. And they talked about how they thought it was a more sophisticated car. Somehow when you get in it, it just feels more European, I guess. Um, and it's interesting because I was talking to my brother-in-law and he said, yeah, that means you have to spend more money to fix it. Um, <laughs> particularly all those little interior fiddly parts, you know, and he's a former BMW driver, a VW driver. Um, and 
but the other parts that were um, different about the ID4 was the peak fast charging at 125 kilowatts versus 74. But they did acknowledge that to get to the same size neuro battery, you had to use, get to that more luxury addition of the VW ID4. So there's a little more cost associated to getting to the same battery size, I think, with the ID4. And I didn't have the super specifics on that. But um, it's exciting to see that um, sales are really um, uh, good in the US and, and elsewhere, and that um, we might have another high volume car. I mean, I would hope that the Nero would be a high volume car and the ID4, and that there might be some nice complementary differences so people can pick between them. Um, it's certainly a, a popular design. You know, any, I know um, my sister and brother in law were like, yeah, we have to have this body style, you know. So. So when I dug a little bit deeper, they made one comment, which was uh, we were comparing the, the ID4 to the uh, last year model Nero. And so I started digging in to find the next year model Nero. And very likely the next year model Nero would bypass the ID4 as far as the factors that they picked up on. Uh, and uh, except there's no indication as of when the 2022 model of the Nero is gonna be uh, delivered uh, later this year sometime. It, it was all I said so far. Um, so let me add to the previous yeah. slide. Uh, so there's actually a uh, Formula E car racing that uh, is uh, running for about five years now. Uh -huh. uh, so there's actually cars that compete with each other that are all electric uh, racing cars. They don't necessarily compete with a combustion engine. Yeah. There's a special category now for that. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah it has been around for a while. It would be good to bring that here to the county. Like uh, we have that racetrack, we could uh -huh, have an uh -huh. electric race thing. I think they actually do race electrics there. Yeah. Already. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. okay. There's a category for it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. so, Sorry. Who was that? Uh, it's Lawrence. So, Sonia, I've got a question about the Kia and the VW. Um, the other day, I heard a Canadian talk uh, by Monroe, and he was saying that the battery size isn't nearly so important, say, as the overall range. And I'm wondering, because some cars are so much more efficient than others, how yeah. those come between the Kia and the VW. You want to answer that, Sonia? It was in the article. Oh, actually, I don't know the exact answer, but I think the Honda would get the best range <laughs> if we it, look back at the designs. Yeah. When if you look at the actually you look at the shape of, of this one, it's interesting. The uh, Volkswagen um, does not get uh, it has a larger battery pack. It has the same range basically as the Kia Niro, uh, because the Kia Niro is five hundred pounds lighter than than the Volkswagen. And, it, and so it was much more efficient than the Volkswagen. Mm. And that's part of what they were also looking at for the next year. They were talking about, uh, for instance, the Volkswagen does not have a heat pump. Uh, the Nero you can get with a heat pump. So for those of us who need to defrost the windshield from time to time, just because it gets wet in the winter, um, that was one of the things I found on the leaf, always killed my range, was being able to see. And with a heat pump, uh, that's a little bit different. By the way, the sales are brisk. One of the other things that we reported on last month was that uh, the forecast is that uh, in EV sales for, I think this year, 2020, that Volkswagen will bypass Tesla as far as the number of EVs sold. Uh, and they expect to grow rapidly uh, after that. Um, Jerry, I'd like to say just one other thing thing about a real world test of these cars designs is that, um, you know, if you look at San Francisco to LA, a lot of times you're looking at two short charge stops versus one long charge stop. And um, you can kind of map that out and kind of think about which of the two, um, you know, how, how, how might you value the two, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but something that I learned from John in a previous meeting is that a larger battery might live longer because you can charge it in a sweeter range. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think I, I, I argued the point that maybe a 250 mile battery would be really great, but then John kind of changed my mind about that. Um, and a little over 300 sounds like a nice sweet spot these days, given our, our distances here. 
anyway, it was it was interesting looking both vehicles up and seeing where where it was, and it made me even more confused as to which car is the next car. Um, Sonia, why don't you bring this one up? Um, so, so this was a fun article out of Car and Driver. Also, in the you know we've even had announcements since two weeks ago. Um, these were all the promises for each of the um, years that, that their promises have been made. So it, if you click through to this article, you'll see the 2030 list and the 2040 list. So this is just a teaser. This is the 2025 list. Um, Audi says they'll have 20 EVs. BMW says EVs will be 15 to 25% of their sales. So you can see that each uh, of the car companies is kind of announcing differently. A couple of these you can kind of compare like Ford and GM are going to spend 29 and 27 billion respectively. Um, I think Stellantis was the one that just announced this week and didn't include it in the slide yet, um, that they too were gonna um, spend about 20 something billion. So um, that, you know, that's great. Um, uh, Jaguar said they'll go all electric. A, a year was not stated. Um, the Land Rover said they'd put in six EVs. Um, Toyota's kind of interesting, you know, there's still like 60 new hybrids, some EVs, some FCVs, and five and a half million in a year of all those combos. So I don't see actually anything interesting about that statement. Um, and then Volkswagen, one and a half million EVs in a year and uh, uh, Volvo. So with Volkswagen and Volvo statements, what I took the, these to mean was that by 2025, this is how many they think they'll be uh, manufacturing and selling. The, the, the Toyota one's interesting because they have not moved off of where they were back in 1999. I testified in Sacramento about EVs and uh, Toyota was there and they were adamant that the future was hybrids. And there was no reason to look at pure EVs, that hybrids were the future. And in a lot of cases, they've stayed that line. Um, I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. Well, Jerry. Yeah. Um, yeah, one, one thing, I actually, I get emails every now and then from a friend of mine who's kind of on the conservative side of the side of things. And, and you know, so it's, he sent this email that was a quote supposedly from uh, Toyota saying that they're not recommending going all electric because there's no way our grid can handle it and stuff like that. And, you know, I replied with, you know, my typical things, but um, having to do with, you know, unplugging the oil refineries will help. But, <laughs> that, you know, it's just interesting. I, I'm fascinated with why they're doing it. Um, it's almost like they're wanting to cut their own throats, but it is a good point that at this point they're getting everybody uh switching over to electric may cause isn't really well fully planned out as far as the industry for battery yeah, yeah, yeah. production and so forth yeah. but for battery production again we talked about it last month uh, in one of the storage x talks um there was a forecast as to how many kilowatt hours batteries will need both for stationary and for mobile applications by 2030 and it was someplace between 18 and 20 terawatt hours uh, worth of batteries. Today we do about 500 gigawatt hours. So we, we have to increase our, our capacity uh, a substantial amount, 40 fold over the next uh, eight, eight years. Um, uh, Jerry, one of the interesting, I, I always wanted to talk, somebody to do a talk on this. Somebody will sign up and do the research on it. I read an article once that talked about the number of kilowatt hours embedded in a gallon of gasoline, that is to get it from the ground uh, through to the gasoline that's in your tank, how many uh, kilowatt hours of electricity is involved in that? And it turned out, uh, well, one quote showed that the amount of electricity in it was the amount of electricity for a 30 mile per gallon, gallon of gasoline. Uh, so um, it was interesting. I'd love somebody to do a report on that. You know, I always wanted to dig that one up myself. Somebody else jumped in on, on stuff on you. Yeah, Jerry, I wanted to say that, you know, there sounds like there's going to be a difficulty getting enough battery together. And I've been a big proponent of vehicle to grid. 
where we can shave off the peaks and yeah. incorporate renewables and get rid of fossil fuels and nuclear off the grid by using yeah, yeah. EVs. But it means they need to be they need to be plugged in a lot of the time. Yeah. And that means that all of our chargers need to be bi-directional. Yeah. And I don't see much action on that. Uh, CCS SAE, they say maybe in five to seven years, they'll allow bi-directional charging. Um, but that's that's not fast enough in my mind. Wait, wait, wait. You, have to, you have to stop because we have a slide on that today. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And also, by the way, uh, the one issue that you said you need to be plugged in. Uh, we're in Sonoma County and Sonoma County, uh, we're covered by the CCA, Sonoma Clean Power, and they have something called Grid Savvy. If you sign up for Grid Savvy, then uh, they'll give you a, a charge station. Uh, and, but then you also sign up saying, oh, we can control your charge station if we want to control your, your charge station. Um, uh, and uh, uh, because they were talking about bi-directional. They did some studies recently when they started to do that to find out how many cars that were on Grid Savvy were actually plugged in. And they were really disappointed because the number of vehicles plugged in was way lower than what they expected. So that's going to be the major problem is, is being plugged in. Um, I'll talk about this let one. Me add, let yeah. me add one comment. Um, I think we're still in this way of thinking where we uh, take the existing mobility system that has grown uh, by uh, easily available fossil fuels and try to replicate it point by mm -hmm, point mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with uh, a very same delivery for mobility, uh, but in electric. And I, when you look at the numbers, they're staggering. And I think at some point we have to start thinking differently about this, right? Mm -hmm. We really need to rethink mobility uh, in a way that uh, is uh, viable in various ways rather than just take the present system and uh, do everything with electric what we used to do with uh, with gasoline and, and stuff like that. Okay. I'm gonna push this forward. Um, you know, I own an airplane, I fly planes apart right now, getting polished and everything else, looking for an AMP. Um, but there's a bunch of new electric airplanes coming out and this category, is looks like it's going to hit the road in the next three years that we're going to see a number of commuter aircraft and a new service level uh, showing up because the cost of flying the planes is going to drop dramatically. Um, uh, so this is one from Bai, and they actually have orders now. They expect to be uh, that their customers will be flying routes by 2025, and these are all in the 500 mile range. Um, uh, the price tag's not bad on something like this, actually, $6 million. Uh, some of the other ones are now in uh, uh, you know, the 15 to 20 passenger uh, level as well. So I, what impressed me on this one was uh, that the cost that they got was one fifth of uh, the cost of flying uh, a fueled aircraft. And um, I don't know if it was, is it in this deck here or was it someplace mm -hmm. else where I, I did a calculation. I've been do, doing trials at Moses Lake now for uh, two years. Um, and uh, that may be on the next slide, actually. Let me see. Yeah, the next slide has some. Yeah. yeah. So I did the calculation on this one with this motor, which is now a, a, a motor which is designed specifically for aircraft, an electric motor uh, with the inverters in, embedded in it. And uh, they've been running now using six dollars worth of electricity compared to 120 dollars worth of fuel for a half an hour of flight um so that'll that'll change some of the numbers unfortunately the really high cost of the flight is burning so the pilot <laughs> over everything else <laughs> uh, and to that end there, there was another article we covered last time uh talking about um uh, pilotless aircraft with a backup pilot who is actually a drone pilot, which the Air Force has been using a lot of. Well, you know, uh, uh, air, autopilots on airplanes are much easier yeah. to, to design and not design so much as to program yeah. as the cars. I mean, yeah. uh, so that you can take them off, fly. You could, the, the last plane I flew was a 777. And you could take that thing off, fly it all the way and land, and uh, the pilot had to taxi at each end, and that was it. 
Well, the, the interesting part for me is one of my friends who I got interested in flying bought himself a 182 after I got him interested, then got himself a Bonanza. He just bought himself a P TBM. <laughs> And I said, so Fritz, what's the lifeline the TBM? He said, I don't know, I program it when I leave from Austin. And, uh, and then the program ends when I land in, in Nevada. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So they're pretty automated as it is. Um, so did you find this one? I didn't read this one at all. Yeah, this is a, a company that is working with Uber um, to provide um, retrofitted uh, Nissan Leafs and Kia Niro EVs with swappable batteries. So um, they match them up with uh, drivers who then go to one of the three sites around the Bay Area and uh, they don't charge their batteries, they just swap them. There you uh, go, Lowell. All you have to do is become an Uber driver. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so, so they've got this all inclusive kind of pilot program where you know, the driver is probably just, you know, paying, uh, you know, uh, a set amount. And um, if they're driving a lot, I don't know how many batteries they're going through. Yeah. yeah. Okay, last one. And so you, I actually started changing the slide too when you gave me the original one, but then you added some of it uh, too. Uh, I'll talk to this one, uh, unless you read up more on it, because I, I have. I I took the screenshot so that you might infer what was going on. Okay, fine. This is the result. I found out about this, uh, and I think we might have reported on this earlier. Uh, I found out about this because of the Climate Center, and Climate Center has an initiative working on programs for various cities uh, for uh, electrifying and resilience. And uh, the person leading the cohort that I'm in uh, is working on the Oakland um, Eco Block. And she mentioned the DC Bell. And I looked at this, and this is a vehicle to grid um, unit. It includes the, um, the uh, switch, sw switch over on it. This one runs at 15 amps. I saw another one they have, I'm uh, sorry, 15 kilowatts. I saw another one they had that ran at uh, 25 kilowatts. And I'm going, shit, you've got to run a 100 amp circuit to, to do that. Now, this one actually requires a 60 amp circuit uh, to get the full throughput on this. Um, but uh, it will work, they'll, um, they'll deliver it with CCS or with um, Chatamo. Uh, in the case of your LEAF, your LEAF, if it's after 2013 or so, that will do vehicle grid already anyway. I don't know if all of the CCSs will do vehicle to grid as well. Um, but uh, it's not approved. None of them are approved for use in California yet, as far as I can tell. Um, Tori, you mentioned that it wasn't approved, right? You have any more details on that? Or where you got that information? Uh, just it was the UL listing wasn't quite finished, but oh, okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, the transfer switch I thought that was interesting. So that's all part of it. And I'm thinking, well, if I take long enough to build the ADU on the over the garage, that uh, I'll install this on the one side uh, for the next electric vehicle and and to power the ADU and power those out. Um, so. What's nice about all of these things is uh, for $28,000, I got a battery to power my house. That's 12.5 kilowatt hours. For $40,000, I got a car and it has a 40 kilowatt hour battery pack in it. So uh, you probably don't want to use up the battery pack's life, uh, the cycles on it, but uh, certainly in emergencies, it would be great to have. Okay, we're going to skip input from the peanut butter gallery where we all talked about whatever we felt like talking about because Tanya's here. And I have your deck, Tanya. Good morning. So would you like me to share it or you'll share it? Oh, looks like you'll I, I can do it from here okay. and, and I, I think it'll look okay. I, I, I fixed almost everything that I could fix. And if, if you go, now, Jerry, now, Jerry, I'll push the button. All right. Well, thank you for this opportunity to uh, provide an update on the RCPA and the work that we're doing on our Sonoma Climate Mobilization Strategy. Uh, and I really look forward and hope that we have plenty of time for uh, Q&A as well as um, inputs from all of you in terms of how we can accelerate EV adoption in Sonoma County. So next slide, please. 
All right, so I'll do a brief introduction and then I would like to give an overview of our recently adopted Sonoma Climate Mobilization Strategy, then go into a more uh, focused discussion on accelerating EV adoption in Sonoma County. And then, as I mentioned, um, hope there's plenty of time for, for discussion. So next slide. Uh, next slide. So just in terms of introduction, uh, so I, my name is Tanya and I am the Director of Climate Programs with the RCPA. I've been with the organization since uh, September 2018. And uh, on the slide here, you see a, a fun photo that we took uh, on Bike to Work Day in the upper left. And then um, most of the staff here at the SCT and RCPA uh, own some form of EV. Uh, we've got one person who owns a Volt. Um, and I bought my first EV, uh, first and only so far, a Volt in uh, August of 2018. And it was, I knew I was going to come to work for the RCP and SCTA, but that wasn't why I bought the car. I've been wanting to purchase my own EV for some time and uh, took advantage of the Sonoma Think Power um, rebates to be able to do that and have been really a very happy EV owner ever since and uh, really looking forward to seeing more people uh, in EVs as I, I know all of you are. So in terms of the RCPA, um, we are a regional agency and our role is really to coordinate climate action across the different uh, levels of, of jurisdiction that you see here. Um, so we do some advocacy at the state level, not a whole lot currently, but uh, that's certainly an area that we want to do more in. Um, as part of our uh, role with the Bay Area Regional Energy Network, we are the uh, lead for Sonoma County, and that is a program that provides energy efficiency upgrades and rebates to uh, electrify homes and to uh, you know, install energy efficiency um, retrofits in, in existing homes. And then we also, of course, coordinate most of our time spent coordinating across the jurisdictions here in Sonoma County. And we are very fortunate to be governed by a board of directors that consists of representatives from all 10 jurisdictions. Um, so we have that um, kind of common forum to work with all of the jurisdictions and get input and direction from uh, the multiple jurisdictions that we serve. And we also partner with um, local agencies such as Sonoma Clean Power, uh, probably do most of our partnering uh, because obviously there's so much uh, overlap and connection. Uh, we also work with Sonoma Water, um, Ag and Open Space District, and Zero Waste Sonoma. So those are some of the groups that we um, coordinate and um, coordinate programs with. So next slide, please. In terms of our mission, uh, as I mentioned, we lead a local government coalition um, and our, our focus is really to um, mobilize regional action in Sonoma County and look for ways that we can leverage resources and funding and staff to achieve our ambitious uh, climate goals. And our vision is that we are united in taking bold action to fight the climate crisis. As we all know, uh, <clears throat> the situation is getting more dire by the day and uh, we have a, a big goal and a, a big need to reduce our emissions. Next slide, please. So this is just a kind of a summary of uh, the role that we play in the county. And so one of the things that we really strive to do is to make the connections between what our local jurisdictions are working on in terms of priorities and how those priorities fit into climate action. And so obviously the way that we uh, you know, build our communities, for example, in terms of more city-centered city -centered development has an impact on our travel patterns and on our need to drive far distances. And so an example of how um, those priorities around building more housing, the way that we build that housing can actually help uh, reduce our carbon footprint. Um, we look for regional scale policies and solutions. Um, an example of that is we worked um, about a year or two ago with uh, several jurisdictions to develop a standard a set of tools that jurisdictions could use to uh, advance an all electric reach code, which would, you know, requires um, all electric in new construction. So we developed some tools and model policies that our jurisdictions could, could use. And now um, we're in the process of looking at um, the, uh, the work that Petaluma did recently to adopt a, a gas station land use ban. And we're bringing a topic to our board on Monday to, to look at the ways that RCK might be able to support other local jurisdictions in adopting similar ordinances. And then finally, we coordinate across the county. Uh, one of the things that our board is also going to be looking at is the uh, what options we have to bring in more funding for climate action in Sonoma County. And so an example of that could be a sale, a new sales tax measure that would raise funding to support climate action. And so that's a role that we play here in Sonoma County. Next slide, please. 
And then lastly, on the organization side, this is just a, a, a picture of what our organization looks like, just to, to, sh to share that we don't have a huge staff currently, and we actually have two positions that are vacant. Um, and Chris Cohn, who's our Water Upgrade Save Program Manager, is 100% dedicated to um, rolling that program out in Sonoma County and actually Bay Area wide. And that's one of the Bay Area Regional Energy Network programs that we uh, participate in. And so she's not actually available to work on other RCPA programs. Um, then we have BC CAPS, who's our climate change program specialist. And then uh, the vacant positions support our communications, community outreach, and then data needs. Next slide, please. All right, uh, so I'd like to give uh, just a brief update on our mobilization strategy. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so some background, as you may uh, recall, uh, the county uh, with RCPA's leadership adopted a climate action plan in 2016 that was known as Climate Action 2020 and Beyond. And the plan was designed to achieve a uh, goal of 25% reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions below 1990 levels by 2020. Um, obviously, we're past 2020 now, so we're looking at a, at a new strategy, um, but that, that plan was released. And then shortly thereafter, um, staff began work on a, a more focused plan looking at our transportation emissions, which are about 60% of our total emissions in Sonoma uh, County and are, I think, one of the more challenging areas to uh, reduce emissions. And so the SHIFT Sonoma County plan came out in 2018. I'll share a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. Um, and then you know, as it became clearer and clearer that we were uh, really in a climate emergency and needed to take more uh, ambitious and aggressive action um, during the, the course of 2019 to 2021, all 10 of our local jurisdictions along with the RCPA passed climate emergency resolutions, really recommitting ourselves to taking action to, to fight the climate crisis. And then one of the, um, the outputs or the outcomes of the RCPA resolution was that our board directed us to develop a new climate strategy, which is now known as the Sonoma Climate Mobilization, Mobilization Strategy. Uh, and that was adopted by our board in 2021. And that strategy um, uh, outlined a new goal for the county, countywide, to be carbon neutral by 2030. Next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot of what, uh, of one, way a 2030 goal of carbon neutral could be achieved. Um, so you can see um, our 1990 backcast of emissions of where we started and that's the kind of the mile, milestone that we measure ourselves against. And then our most recent inventory that was done for the 2018 calendar year. Um, and that purple bar is the transportation challenge that we face. Um, the gray um, smaller uh, bar is the building energy emissions and then even smaller you see solid waste. Um, ag, which is fertilizer and li livestock, and water and wastewater. And so the point of this slide is that to meet the 2030 carbon neutral goal, we're fairly certain now things could change and it'd be wonderful if they did change uh, in terms of uh, faster adoption of uh, mitigation measures, but we're fairly certain that we're not going to get to zero emissions by 2030. Um, and so what that means for us to meet our 2030 goal is that we need to offset that or absorb the remaining carbon um, through increased carbon sequestration. And that's what that green bar is. And the model here just assumes an 80% reduction in each sector. Uh, and again, we may find that in transportation, achieving 80% reduction by 2030 is going to be, you know, maybe very challenging. But if EV adoption happens faster, perhaps, than we're thinking it will happen, that could help us get to that goal uh, by 2030. If we can stop here for a second, this is an interesting slide uh, to ask some questions. The mm -hmm. the change in the building energy, that's predominantly the result of Sonoma Clean Power, would you yep. say? Yeah, okay. yep, it is. And transportation stayed about the same. Yep. And you're looking at electrification as, as what will impact transportation? We see electrification and to Zeno's earlier point about looking at our, our mobility model, um, we also see the need to, you know, shift more of our, tr our travel, our mobility solutions to transit, biking, walking, other micro mobility solutions, perhaps, you know, we're starting to see increased interest in e-bikes. Um, I haven't heard as much about scooters and some of the other um, smaller mobility solutions, but um, we definitely want to be looking at those other options as well, because um, one of the trends that we're seeing, and it, it happened here at Sonoma County, is that our vehicle miles traveled 
is actually continuing to increase. So increase. people are driving more. And so we're not going to be able to achieve our reduction goals, even if we move, you know, as we move to EVs, if people are driving more and more, um, we're not going to meet the goals that we have. And there are also other impacts of uh, driving, you know, in yeah. terms of health and, and wellness of our community. Yeah, and I recognize that we have a particularly more difficult problem here than some other areas mm -hmm. in the Bay Area. In the Silicon Valley, 39% of their emissions are is transportation, closer to 70% for us as a result of the uh, improvements in building now. Is that's a big nut to crack. It is, it is very challenging. Sonia, this is Sonia uh, uh -huh. speaking. Um, can you speak to the uh, ways that, that carbon sequestration might occur? Um, you know, currently are there are there techniques that we can use to um, uh, sequester carbon? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. So we are um, very fortunate in Sonoma County to have you know, an abundance of open space, uh, working land, so agriculture, and there are a number of practices that can be applied on those types of landscapes, um, such as composting, um, um, planting hedgerows, um, no-till farming. So there's a number of practices that have been shown to increase the amount of uh, carbon that is absorbed into the soil. And the, our resource conservation districts, which are uh, local organizations that work with our farming community, they've actually been um, supporting the development of something called a carbon farm plan that actually evaluates on a farm by farm basis, looks at the landscape and the, you know, what's being grown, the farming practices, and then puts together a plan that outlines what changes can be made to increase the sequestration and then actually quantify that. And there's a, a tool that they use to, to be able to quantify it. Uh, the amount of emissions that are that the amount of sequestration that occurs and then we're also looking at um, kind of an emerging field of uh, urban sequestration and so you know in your own backyard garden or in city parks uh, the landscaping practices how can we increase sequestration within our more built up spaces as well and that's kind of a newer area that we want to look at All right, so now I'll give just a brief overview of our strategies in the Sonoma Climate Mobilization. Um, so we have 13 and they are uh, divided into these four initiative areas. So the first decarbonization is really all about um, you know, reducing, eliminating greenhouse gas emissions. And we see that happening through the building energy sector, uh, then transportation obviously, and solid waste. Um, so in the building energy, we are uh, looking at both uh, electrifying new construction completely. And then uh, the bigger challenge for us is retrofitting our existing buildings. And so um, programs like the Bay Area Regional Energy Network that offer rebates to you know, replace your gas powered water heater with a heat pump water heater, for example, um, that's the kind of change that we need to see happen in all of our buildings, as well as making them more energy efficient. So doing the sealing, the, the you know, sealing the, the cracks in the building envelope and making sure there's enough insulation and those kinds of changes to the, the building itself that can make it more energy efficient and then removing all of the gas powered appliance and appliances and replacing them with electric. And um, that kind of along with the transportation challenge is a big challenge just because of the scale. You know, obviously uh, the more all of our buildings are versus a much smaller amount of new construction. And then continuing to work with Sonoma Clean Power on uh, cleaning up the electricity supply, you know, certainly huge progress made there, but there is still a small amount of uh, change that can be made uh, and Sonoma Clean Power is working to, um, you know, really make sure their, their electricity is 100% uh, uh, carbon free. And then transportation, uh, kind of back to the earlier comments about needing to look at our mobility um, solutions. So we have a Drive Less Sonoma County campaign that's looking at ways to reduce the need to drive. And then of course the EV access for all, and I'll really spend more time on that in a bit. Um, and then finally, the Sonoma County Vehicle Miles Travel Bank is a, a, a way of uh, increasing funding for alternative transportation modes. And I won't go into much detail on that, uh, but it's, it's a fairly, new idea and we it's one that we want to explore more to see if we can raise additional funding for bike and transit investments in the county. Um, zero Waste by 2030 is really an effort that's being led by the Zero Waste Sonoma County organization or agency, um, but really recognizing that the, the waste that we dispose uh, emits 
uh, carbon, as well as just looking at ways to reduce what we're buying to begin with and, and looking at the consumption patterns and how those influence the amount of emissions that we generate. And then there's the sequestration and ecosystem services that we talked a little bit about. Um, so making sure that we're protecting what we've already stored, um, you know, in terms of our forests and our landscapes, and then uh, looking at practices to increase the sequestration. And then finally, we, we see a need to scale up our infrastructure for sequestration, meaning that um, we need more compost and we need more plant material and we need the workforce that would be able to go out to the farms and implement these practices. And so a whole set of um, objectives and strategies around scaling up that infrastructure. And then under resilience and adaptation, um, really looking at some of the, the questions that I've heard and came up earlier in your conversation about, you know, what's going to happen when we fully electrify our transportation and our building energy system and can our grid handle it? And so looking for um, solutions like microgrids and redesigning our energy grid or electricity grid to support that future of um, all electric. And then climate resilient Sonoma County is really taking the there's been a lot of work that's been done in Sonoma County over time, looking at the impact of climate change, you know, in terms of um, high heat days and drought and flooding and um, wildfires and really moving those plans forward, working with our local jurisdictions. And then lastly, equity and community engagement. We recognize that we can't be successful with all of our strategies if we're not um, really engaging the community and looking for um, equitable solutions and working towards equitable solutions um, in all of our policies. And then I've included the link on the slide to our website where you can find the full strategy document and more information on the mobilization. So next slide, please. Okay. Um, you want questions oh, yeah. at the end? Questions. I have, uh, yeah. yeah I, I'm kind of, happy to take questions as we go along. So. Yeah, because I, I was scribbling some, some down. One, one of the questions I had was uh, one of the groups I get email from on a regular basis is uh, Seamless Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's bothered me because quite frankly, since we moved up here, I haven't used public transit very much at all because it runs too infrequently and it's way too expensive. And if I want to get to someplace like San Francisco, um, I might have to use uh, three different conveyances, each one with its own fee, each one with its own schedule. The schedules don't seem to be synchronized. Um, do you work with Seamless? Is it, are they working in the right direction? Is anybody working on making a, a Bay Area transit system? Even here in, in the Santa Rosa area, we've got one, two, three, we have three different transit districts that service Sebastopol? Yeah, so so that's a great question. And we're not, um, at least I'm not actively working with Seamless uh, Bay Area, although I am aware of, of the group, but I, I'm pretty sure I'm on their email list as well. Um, but we do have a local effort that's going on um, led by our, our board formed a, a, a future of transit, we call it ad hoc about, I think it maybe has been maybe almost a year ago now, um, to look at exactly this issue. How do we um, you know, create the, the future transit system that we need to really meet our needs in Sonoma County? And so that group has been working, our board members along with the transit providers, local transit providers, um, and really looking at ways to, you know, first within kind of the existing funding structure that we have, how can we make our transit systems work more effectively and efficiently from an end user perspective? And so they are looking at, um, you know, initially, and, and in fact, there was a study that was done um, under SCTA that looked at um, transit integration and made yeah. some recommendations in terms of, you know, from all the way from fully consolidating all of the transit systems into one, which is not what's being looked at currently. But a step before that, can the existing transit providers, you know, coordinate their schedules and have a common marketing and branding um, effort so that as an end user, I only have to look at one, one website, for example, to find the bus schedules. Um, and there's you know, one, one set of materials that someone could look at, maybe a single app that would make it easy to, to plan your trip. So that's what this group is, is really focusing on in the near term. And I think they've gotten um, pretty far along with the effort and now they're seeking funding to actually implement some of the changes um, to put that in, into place. So I mean, as a consumer, I mean, mm -hmm. I'd like to go out and uh, go buy myself a ticket to go from uh, Sebastopol to San Jose. Mm -hmm. And then I can take whichever uh, conveyance I, I need to in order to make the connections to, to get from point A to point B. And the reason we get in the car quite often is once you've got two people, actually one person these days, 
-hmm. It's less expensive to take a car. You, that is the thing that needs to be addressed is, is it has to be less expensive not to take the car, and which was mm -hmm. true in Europe when we lived in Europe because it was always cheaper to take public transit than it was to, to take a car someplace. Uh, a different question you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier about uh, coordinating and you don't work so much at the state level. And one of the things you have here on this slide uh, has to do with the energy grid. In Sebastopol, uh, we've been looking at and trying to figure out how we could do microgrids. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out 90% of the challenge in doing microgrids has nothing to do with technology, it has everything to do with legislation and regulation. And we need organizations that are actually gonna work at the state level to get the regulations and, and legislation changed so that microgrids uh, actually are um, possible. Uh, even the Oakland group thought they had it all done and then, then once they brought it to uh, um, the state, they said, no, that's, that's illegal. Even PG&E didn't know it was illegal and they were working with them. Yeah. So that's a difficult area as well. Mm -hmm. Anybody else with questions? Uh, Jerry, I just want to comment that, you know, the Clipper card has made it possible to not have to pay different fares to different carriers. I mean, and, and I just saw in the last two weeks that uh, you can now just use your cell phone as your Clipper card in the near field capacity. So, I mean, you can, uh, without having to think about fares and, and uh, how you're going to pay them, uh, that has been accomplished here in the Bay Area. Well, David, explain this part to me. I, I thought with the Clipper card, and I have one, uh, that if I go from the bus now onto the ferry, I've got to pay two different fees. Yeah, yeah, you're paying to each one of those providers. Yeah, and what I'm talking about is that you would pay the fee single to go from point A to point B, not just sing yeah, single payer, and you pay to go from point A to point B, and they don't care which way you do it. Um, right. I, I'd request that we let Tanya finish and then have Q and A at the end. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we can go to the next slide. <laughs> Great questions. Thank you. All right. So um, just wanted to share a little bit more about the transportation related strategies. And the next slide, I'll talk about the what we're prior, prioritizing for near term action by the RCPA. So we have our drive less Sonoma County campaign I mentioned. Um, so looking at how we can um, you know, find really find funding. It's like most of the cities, have, well, they don't all have current bike ped plans. And that's, that's an effort that that's an issue that we're trying to address, again, through getting some additional funding to create updated bike ped plans. Uh, but for example, the city of Santa Rosa recently updated its bike ped master plan. And so there is a, a plan that has, um, you know, much improved bike facilities. And now it's really a matter of finding the funding to implement that plan. Um, so that's uh, one of the areas of focus here. We have an initiative that's underway, a partnership between the Sonoma County Transportation Authority and the Department of Health Services to, uh, implement, to create a Vision Zero Action Plan, uh, which is designed, will be designed to basically eliminate um, traffic fatalities and severe injuries from you know, vehicle crashes, uh, bike and pedestrian involved crashes. Um, and that's really a, a nationwide international effort recognizing the impact of um, you know, the way our streets are designed, speed limits, et cetera, on safety. And so we feel that that's a very important part of encouraging more folks to bike and walk and use transit. Um, they need to feel safe. And then we talked about the next generation transit system. And then the SCTA is, uh, has just released the final draft of its uh, update to the comprehensive transportation plan that also will be um, on our board's agenda for this Monday. Um, and the SCTA will be doing some additional outreach around that plan. And we include that here because the plan has policies such as, you know, paying for parking, um, eliminating parking requirements in new development or reducing parking requirements. Um, and so, and pricing parking differently to again, encourage people to find alternatives to driving and parking at, at a destination. Um, then there's the EV Access for All partnership, uh, which is really focused on, you know, continuing to incre increase the number of charging stations that we have, um, really focused on public and workplace, um, making EVs more accessible and affordable. And then I mentioned earlier, kind of the alter other uh, micro mobility options like e-bikes and, uh, you know, who knows what kinds of other lightweight um, EVs will be coming out. And then also on the other end of the spectrum, the heavy duty trucks and, you know, construction and other types of um, vehicles that also need to be converted to electric. And then finally, the Vehicle Miles Travel Bank, which is really a way of funding um, additional uh, 
finding additional funding for transportation programs. So next slide, please. So this is the set of strategies that our board identified as kind of near-term priorities. So the mobilization strategy overall is a 10-year effort, 10-year plus, um, and we, we needed to start smaller because uh, it's a lot to take on at once. And even this list actually is pretty uh, daunting when, when you think back to the size of the team that we currently have. Uh, but I mentioned the All Electric Buildings campaign. One of the first things that we're looking at doing there is uh, an inventory of our existing building stock and um, you know, how many are commercial versus res residential versus industrial, um, what's the kind of energy footprint of those buildings, and then starting to use that information to map out a, a strategy and a plan um, for retrofits, and looking at, you know, what are the policy options that we have to encourage or require retrofitting of existing homes, and then the all-electric reach codes I mentioned. Um, we talked about the transit system under Drive Less Sonoma County, um, EV access for all partnership, um, really focusing on uh, charging, supporting the uh, other alternative types of um, mobility solutions, and then really focusing in from an equity perspective on how we can um, increase the number of EVs that are accessible to lower income um, communities. Um, increased carbon stocks, focusing in on those carbon farm plans and how we can support our local ag producers to scale up their efforts there. And then a number of activities around the outreach and engagement. We have a climate action advisory committee. And so working to increase diversity of representation and also looking to work with that committee and the community at large to increase outreach and education around climate. Um, and then finally partnering with community-based organizations who have those connections in uh, say with the Latinx community, with lower income communities, and can we can really work with them to increase the communication and outreach. And then finally, um, there are a number of uh, really excellent models out there of other jurisdictions that have developed tools and checklists and uh, models to actually evaluate the equity impact of any new policy and have integrated those into their process. And so we want to uh, research what those models are and then, and then bring those home to Sonoma County and work with our local jurisdictions to integrate those into our uh, policy practices. So that's what our near-term focus is. And I, when I say near-term, over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, so next slide, please. All right, so that was the mobilization strategy. And now I'd like to talk for a few minutes about accelerating EV adoption in Sonoma County. So I mentioned at the beginning that we, in 2018, released the Sonoma County Shift, Sonoma County Low Carbon Transportation Action Plan. And it really had two areas. So the first was um, addressing mode shift. So shifting from single occupant vehicles to shared transportation, biking, walking, transit. Um, and these were the goals that were set for 2040. Uh, and you can see the pie charts on the right um, kind of demonstrate the, the magnitude of the challenge that we face in terms of for both all trips as well as commute trips, you know, what percentage today are taken by single occupant vehicles. And you can see um, for commute trips, 77%. Um, and I think this data was from 2015. Um, so just a snapshot in time in terms of what our distribution has been. And I don't, I don't think it shifted significantly. Although certainly during COVID, we saw with you know, people working from home. <clears throat> and we'll be looking at how does that change as folks return to the office? Um, you know, how do our commute patterns change? So next slide, please. Uh, so this is probably the slide that's of more interest to this group, which is the fuel shift goals. And these were set for 2030. So the first is to reduce countywide um, gas use by 50%. Um, and doing that by increasing the number of EVs to 100,000. And we have right around 10,000 EVs, um, I think was the, <clears throat> the latest data that I saw from 2020. So we have quite a ways to go in terms of uh, increasing that number. And at the same time, we know we need to increase the number of charging stations. Um, and I mentioned earlier, the you know looking at increasing access to uh, low-income households and communities of concern, as well as you know, integrating EVs into our municipal fleets, uh, as well as public charging at government facilities. So these were kind of the key goals. Uh, so next slide, please. And these are kind of a, a brief update on progress to date. So we did um, launch a car share or complete a car share pilot, I would say. There were two uh, zip cars that were, one was located, <clears throat> I believe in Railroad Square uh, near the smart station and the other was in downtown Santa Rosa. Um, they did not, the, the pilot was not um, wildly successful. And so it basically closed down um, without any plans that I know of at least to 
to, to, to do a new pilot. Um, although I am personally still interested in the idea of car sharing and uh, we'll be looking at models from other communities like there's a, uh, an effort in Sacramento to implement um, an EV car share in a low income community. And so looking at other ways of, again, making EVs more accessible to a broader um, set of community members. Um, so we also did an online knowledge base that hopefully all of you are aware of. If you're not, I would encourage you to check this out, um, really just to try and increase the understanding and awareness of, you know, how wonderful EVs are and how easy they are, um, and to try and, you know, help address some of the, the concerns and questions around range and charging and all of that. Um, We've also worked with our local jurisdictions on and, and some local businesses around increasing EV awareness. We updated um, a set of charging station guidelines and also worked with our jurisdictions to implement the EV uh, permitting streamline, EV charging uh, streamlining that is required. Um, we've done some work on an EV charging siting analysis, and I think I included one of the slides or the maps from that in the slide deck. Um, worked with the county to implement a clean commute program that provided information and um, you know, reduced fares on SMART, for example, to encourage employees to use alternative modes of transportation. Um, we have a county-wide emergency ride home program. So if you ride your bike to work and have to get home for an emergency with a you know, childcare or something, there's a way to you know, get an Uber or a taxi and be reimbursed for that. And then finally, we are um, looking forward to launching a bike share pilot um, that will be uh, in place near the smart stations in Marin and Sonoma counties. I don't have a date by when those stations are going to be up and running, but it is getting much closer. Uh, it's actually been a pretty big project that uh, one of my colleagues in SCTA has been working on quite a bit over the last couple of years, but those will be e-bikes. Uh, and so it's going to be pretty exciting to see that roll out uh, here in Sonoma County. So next slide, please. So here is uh, one of the tools that we developed, the EV charging um, siting analysis, and I included the link to the online map. Um, and so the SCTA team worked with us to do an assessment based on these different data sources to look at, you know, where does it make the most sense to locate uh, more public and workplace charging. Um, this was last updated in uh, October of 2019. So one of the things on my list is to go back and look at, you know, what progress have we made since this original um, analysis was done. And we provided actually to each jurisdiction a list of the, I think it was a top 10 or top 20, um, you know, most promising or most, um, you know, the, the charging locations that we felt would be the most useful for that community in terms of this analysis. And so we need to go back and really evaluate how many of those stations have been installed uh, since that time. So Did, next does that slide. include analysis of the infrastructure to make sure that it was suitable? You know, I, that's a good question that I don't know. I would have to go back and look at, at the work that was done. Um, that was before I joined the RCPA, but I can certainly find out. Um, so then I just, uh, I, I think there were some questions about data. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, so there's a, a good online resource for data on EV adoption. And I, I'm pretty sure there's also a section on this website that shows charging. Yeah, there's a, a public-private charging um, data that you can access on the site as well. So I just thought it was interesting to look at the, the and these are uh, numbers as of 2020, um, end of 2020. So looking at California in total, and then for Sonoma County, what our um, you know, number of, actually, so we're just under 10,000 um, light duty EVs, both uh, battery electric and plug-in and, and fuel cell. And then you can see the, the magnitude of the total uh, vehicles that we have and what percentage are still powered by gasoline. Um, so that kind of shows you the, uh, the effort that we have ahead of us to convert. But I, you know, the signs are very promising. The data that you were sharing earlier about how it feels like we've, we've kind of turned a corner in terms of the, the auto industry really embracing electric. And, you know, so I think we're going to, we're going to see rapid change over the next number of years. Um, and then, of course, with the governor's executive order that there will be no more fossil fuel um, powered cars sold in 2035, uh, that will also start really, I think, moving us faster towards the goals that we have. So next slide, please. Oh, and then this slide I thought was interesting just in terms of the uh, adoption of EVs, the different models that have been uh, purchased here in Sonoma County, and then the model year, you know, my, my bolt is a 2018. Um, and I don't know if that those higher bars in 2017 and 2018 correlate with, you know, for example, the Sonoma Clean Power Incentives. I don't think they were available in 2019, but I, I could be wrong on that. 
um, you know, but just interesting to see that pattern over time. And of course, we want to see those bars continue to increase um, up and to the right. So you can go into this and look at all different sorts of uh, views of the data. It's, it's a really good tool. So next slide, please. So challenges and opportunities. Um, and these are really the, 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 um, the things that will be informing the work that the uh, RCPA is doing. Um, so I mentioned you know, EV charging at workplaces and multifamily housing. Those of us who are fortunate enough to own our own homes, you know, I've got a charging um, station in my garage. And so it's easy for me to charge. In fact, I, very, I, I can't remember the last time I had to charge anywhere other than my house. Now, sadly, that means I don't get out very far uh, very often, um, but I do recall doing a trip down to Southern California uh, and, and that was a good learning experience for me in terms of charging at other places and kind of develop my awareness of, of how, how much more work we have to do on those um, public charging stations. But at any rate, we recognize that in order for EVs to be really widely adopted in Sonoma County, we have to tackle the challenge of you know, folks who live in apartments and in you know, multifamily housing complexes, um, lower income developments, they don't have that opportunity to have their own charging station in a garage. And so we, we really have to tackle that challenge. And part of that solution will be, of course, increasing the amount of charging that's available at workplaces. Um, second area in terms of equity, uh, really exploring opportunities for used EVs and, you know, are there programs that we could um, implement that would, you know, encourage more, um, you know, make, make those more accessible to, to folks as, as one way to uh, increase equity. And then I mentioned the micromobility. So, you know, continuing to work on e-bikes and other solutions. Of course, transit and school bus electrification. Our transit operators are working to electrify their fleets. And in fact, they have requirements from the state to electrify their fleets. Um, and that, again, is really a funding issue and challenge, as well as having the infrastructure in place to charge those uh, transit buses. And then finally, the mobilization strategy um, and our EV access for all partnership. And one of the kind of first steps that we're taking in that is really to do an assessment. I think if you go to the next slide, I've got um, these points on there. Um, yeah, so looking at the progress that we've made on the fuel shift actions, and there's you know several pages worth of actions that were outlined in that plan, um, some of which we've completed, others are still in progress. So really assessing where we are with those and what needs to be done. Um, there's a, a group out of Stanford that is doing a study on decommissioning internal combustion vehicles, and they're coming from a premise of you know, we, the last thing we want to have happen is all of us who can afford them buy EVs and we sell our gas powered vehicles to people who don't have as much money and can't afford an EV and they continue having to drive these gas powered vehicles for, you know, time into the future. And we're not actually retiring those cars off the road completely. And so they're doing a study on, you know, what are the, what are the possible solutions to this challenge? And it really, um, I think part of their work is focused on um, understanding the needs of lower income um, and what we're, and actually this is a Metropolitan Transportation Commission term, what, what is now being called an equity priority community, which tend to be lower income, um, BIPOC, um, and folks who don't have access to the resources that, that you know, some of us have access to. And so looking at through this work with the Stanford group, um, what are the needs of those communities and how can we make EVs more accessible, as well as, again, retiring those gas-powered cars. Um, we, we partner with Sonoma Clean Power on a lot of programs and we'll continue to work with them on additional EV actions. And then finally, I'll be bringing an update on our EV strategy to our board um, in September of this year. So I think that was my last slide. Yeah, so now I just welcome questions and really your feedback and inputs um, you know, as I'm developing this update to our EV strategy, you know, what kinds of things do you think we should be considering working on, um, you know, what ideas do you have for some of the challenges that we face? Uh, just really look forward to hearing your thoughts and feedback. Tanya, oh, David you? Harris here. I want to uh, raise the question of, you know, next generation transit, uh, self-driving vehicles would have a tremendous impact on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a good way or a bad way, people can think about, <laughs> thinking about that in that group, because um, that would change the need to own a car, you know, our density and the cost of, of drivers for public transit. Mm -hmm. been, if they're shared, you mean if we replace our right. traditional idea of transit with shared. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I have, I have read of, you know, other communities, I don't know how widespread this is yet, but that are using like a, 
um, you know, an, an, an AV, like a shuttle bus that goes around a downtown or goes around a uh, defined area um, as a transit solution. So definitely, you know, I don't right. that's what the group's looking at now, but certainly longer term. But, uh, you know, the, the thing that starts to show us that not everybody would need to own a car is Uber and Lyft. Mm -hmm. But I think Uber and Lyft probably have a lower percentage of EVs uh, on the road than maybe the general population, right? I mean, you know, and, and we did have something earlier about the, the battery swap. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that would certainly have an impact there. Is, is that uh, on the radar? I don't know if they're discussing that at this point, but I can, I can find out. Um, I mean, I think, was, I think the concern with Uber and Lyft and, and AVs in general is that they're not necessarily going to, I mean, certainly we want them to be electric, uh, but even then they, they don't necessarily reduce the vehicle miles traveled, uh, as, as I'm sure that you're aware of. And studies done that, you know, they've actually seen vehicle miles traveled increase, um, which has other negative effects. So, okay. Uh, Woody, has his hand up. Woody has his hand up and also he might know, of, was there legislation or proposed, Woody, you guys can speak to that. Yeah, there is currently legislation. It is on the legislation page. I don't remember the bill number. Uh, it's uh, it's live. It's active. A bill that would require, and I don't, I'm not sure this is getting to exactly what you're concerned about, but it, that uh, all um, uh, autonomous uh, vehicles would need to be uh, uh, electric. Uh, so that bill. There was another one that I was referring to is something about uh, um, Uber and a uh, requirement for them to Uber and Lyft to go electric as well. Yes, I think that one got sidelined, but I'd need okay. to check on it. And we do keep uh, a, a legislation page at the Climate Center, theclimatecenter.org, and then uh, our work, and then legislation, I think, is how you navigate to that. So I think I might have missed it because I was doing a little multitasking, but is there a schedule, Tanya, for the presentations on the climate mobilization strategy? I mean, you're doing a series of presentations, right, um, to the cities, and is there a schedule? You know, we don't, the only one we have scheduled so far is to the city of Healdsburg on August 2nd, uh, but we don't have any others scheduled yet. Um, so, are, but they are going to be, and is that going to be published or is that just, you're just doing it bit by bit? Or what? Well, it would be, yeah. So we're, we're really doing it on request at this point. So we, uh, we have asked our, our directors, our board members to, you know, help us in that process. Um, so it, it, it's a good question for me to follow up on with them, um, to see when they'd like us to come present to their councils. So we've probably done more presentations to, you know, groups like this. We've presented to a couple of the um, climate subcommittees of the of each of the cities, but um, you know definitely want to do more presentations. So, um, cool. Just uh, and just what, I've got a bunch of things I'd love to talk about, but we obviously don't have time. And other people, the the thing that I think would be super helpful for you know reducing the transpo GHGs mm -hmm. is if we could get the California Energy Almanac that the California Energy Commission puts out to get them to uh, measure uh, gasoline use at city level. They do have it at the county level, but not the city level. Mm. And so I don't know if RCPA could agitate for that kind of thing, because then you could set, uh, you know, measure it, and then you could set reduction targets year over year and know what we're doing, you know? Um, anyway, so yeah, that's the yeah. probably most important one. Yeah. Uh, before we go to Zeno, I, I want to ask a question that Ben posted earlier. Uh, he, ben asked a simple question. How have we done so far since we did have a climate action plan? Uh, how have we done coming into 2020? Did we yeah, achieve you know, our we, goals we or not? Have, yeah, we don't know yet because we haven't done the 2020 inventory. There's okay. a, a, a time lag. So we hope to start working on that. I would say probably later this, uh, maybe in the fall of 2021, we'll start working on that inventory. But we actually, there's data that we're not able to get as nearly as real time as we'd like, um, okay. but uh, yeah, right. I, I can. Yeah. I'm fairly. I could probably say with fairly high degree of certainty that we did not meet the reduction goal that we'd set for 2020. But I don't know how far off we were. So. Okay, Zeno, off mute first. Yeah, so our infrastructure is built around cheap gas, right? That so this development. Uh, has happened for 80 years, and we kind of locked into a lot of that infrastructure. Um, 
and I, I don't see any uh, addressing this issue in the plan. But let me focus on one example. So we have um, people bringing their kids to school in a private car. Mm -hmm. uh, we fund these schools through tax money, property taxes, and these schools build uh, parking lots for their, uh, uh, in high schools for their uh, seniors. Mm -hmm. uh, even in Sebastopol now, we are unifying two school districts uh, or two schools, high schools. So kids that used to go to El Molino in Forestville will have to be dropped off at, uh, uh, in, 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 in Sebastopol. Uh, then there is like specialized classes that are still done in Forestville. So the whole issue of this uh, climate impact and greenhouse gases mm. seem to may have been missed. Mm. And this is just one example of uh, disconnected thinking that we haven't really been doing yet. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see the, 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 the plan to address these infrastructure, uh, jurisdiction, regulation, that kind of thing. Uh, at least start, start talking about that because we haven't really been talking about that. Yeah, that's a great, great question, great point. And I think one of the ways that we envision that happening and but we haven't really thought much, thought as much about schools and, and school districts as we should. Um, we really, we tend to think of our local jurisdictions in terms of the cities and the county. Um, but one of the strategies that we have under the equity and climate section is, is really developing a way of integrating climate thinking into all of our policy development. So that, you know, you brought up a great examples, you know, of really needing to think about the climate impact as that decision was made, for example, about consolidating schools and, you know, the decisions um, schools make about parking and, you know, whether it's free or not, or, you know, those kinds of things, um, you know, so that's one, one way that we could start uh, influencing that. Um, earlier, you, you brought up one point on, on a slide uh, about um, the lower income families not being able to um, get electric and they're going to end up with our gas cars. Uh, two years ago, maybe three years ago, Sonia and Cecilia and Bernie and I were at, I guess it was Earth Day, and we brought electric vehicles. And a takeaway that I had at that time was 90% of the people who spoke to me um, said they wanted an electric vehicle. And 90% of the people who spoke to me had never bought a new car. And so it's used cars. And in California, 70% of the cars registered to new owners every year are used cars. And yet I see virtually no used electric vehicle car lots. I see very few being offered at the dealers. Um, and it would seem that it'd be great to find a way to, to build a focus I'm making mm -hmm. sure all the vehicles that come in. When I've asked the dealer that I returned my car to, what's going to happen to it, my, my last electric car, they scrap it because it's what? more cost effective to, for them to scrap it and get the material out mm -hmm. of it. They get more money for it than selling it. Oh, um, that's uh, not so good. We need to turn that around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sonia, you got your hand up next. We'll get to you, Bruce. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, I, I was kind of curious. Um, since it looks like you're about three and a half people and I, I hope you have an office dog to keep you all company. Um, you know, that, that's the startup way of, of doing things. Um, I, I was wondering if you could give us some um, guidance, you know, as, as an electric auto club, we look to try to have impact in the community. So I'm curious, you know, what you might think is the best use of our time as a club, but also just as individual community members as well. So I think in terms of as a club, um, certainly, you know, sessions like today and providing input um, to us as we develop the strategy. So any, you know, or, and, and I guess in terms of maybe research. So as you know, it looks like you're really, um, you know, staying on top of the latest developments. And so being a um, kind of a source for the RCPA to look to, you know, like what's happening in the, in the new car market and what kinds of changes do you see coming in and how do you think those might impact our plans here to, to roll out EVs or to increase the adoption. So really maybe providing that kind of um, the research and the, the input and advice around how we can um, increase the adoption of EVs here. Uh, you know, certainly if you have any 
ideas or thoughts around this low income um, access and charging uh, challenge that we have. And then I would also say from an advocacy standpoint, you know, I don't, I don't know how often you get involved in local policy, but if there comes a time, or maybe not if, but when we, we put forward a policy, um, you know, which might be requiring EV charging in certain kinds of new developments, for example, or, you know, I, I can't imagine what it might be at this point, but really providing support um, to the local jurisdictions that are considering those ordinances and those regulations that would, would really be in support of advancing EVs um, here in Sonoma County. So those, those are a couple of thoughts that I would have. Thanks, because I hadn't thought of those things. And I, I did look at the electric car um, uh, stats that you provided, and I, I would be hopeful that we could be a little more optimistic. We could probably look at the, that data mm -hmm. a little bit since you're missing a data specialist. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. A number of us can do that stuff. Um, uh, Bruce, you're up next. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd jump in here. Uh, interesting conversations. Lots of stuff going on up here in San Juan County right now. And you you were asking about uh, uh, you know putting used EVs to better use. We're desperately looking for more used EVs. We have a a used EV car dealer who has 30 years of experience in car dealerships. He's based on Orcas. Our our publicly owned co-op has authorized 27 of these what they're calling the happy deal I don't know how they we don't have a McDonald's here but I would I would say that's that's you know borderline you know basically what you, you what you get is uh, $2,500 of support to install an EV charger when you buy one of these used EVs and um, I'm still a little bit addicted to EVs so I'm, I've got the stasis at six fully electric cars in my driveway, but they've changed <laughs> over. So I bought Alan Soule's Roadster. We now have at least three of the classic Roadsters on this island alone that I know of. And uh, I, I bought a used e-golf e that was kind of the, the basic one. And I've determined that it was bought in California by somebody's parents and their kid took it to Hood River, Oregon beat the crap out of it because it's got like dents and scratches, but it's only got like 14,000 miles and it was like uh, $12,000. $12, and then this white one came along, it's got 58,000 miles on it and it's uh, 2015. So now I've got two of those in the driveway, but I'm, I'm, I'm helping to get those um, to my friends because um, our co-op, frankly, is a little, um, unless you're actively looking on their website, you kind of miss out on some of these incentive programs. But mm. anyway, the, what, the bottom line is my friend, David Griffin, who has the, the, the store, the, the EV store buys batches of used, used EVs out of California. They all have California white stickers on them. And um, he's putting bids on them as fast as they sell. So you can go to the, the website that he's got and you'll see some EVs, but most of those have already been sold. I noticed he's got a few Kia Souls in the last week, but if you know a, a way, a source to get bunches of these, I think we can find a home for them because we're, we're basically the ideal place for short range vehicles. Well, before we go to Brad, I just wanna pipe in on that one because Tanya, don't give him any information whatsoever, but instead, <laughs> Um, why can't we find a way that we could uh, either induce a dealer to become a specialist in EVs or set up a dealership uh, through the various municipalities um, so that we could make the vehicles available? I mean, it's been something which has been painful. I don't have the expertise. Jerry, in, the last minute, in, yeah. in the last minute or two, could you take the discussion slide off and let us see each other so oh yeah 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 sure sure sure, nicer, sure i think sure 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 that'd be fine uh, in, in any case i made the point but uh, brad you're up next and i'll stop that yeah thank you tanya um you made you spoke a little bit about doing a car sharing experiment and i don't know if you're aware of peer-to-peer -peer car sharing and the largest company that i know of in the space is turo um and we actually were talking about sharing a, or converting a Toyota Tacoma to a shared electric truck earlier in the group meeting. And trucks are one of those vehicles that a lot of people have as kind of an extra or a third car. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered if you've explored uh, through your work peer-to-peer -peer car sharing in neighborhoods with trucks in particular other, you know, um, kind of limited use vehicles where people use them maybe five times a year or whatever. 
We haven't. I think that's a very intriguing idea. Um, and I'm aware of, of the peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. I actually participated in, um, it, I think this is the same thing. I think it was called Get Around. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's another one. Uh, I don't know if there's an active one here now, but but I'm intrigued by that idea. Thank you. Uh, we'll definitely look into it. Uh, David, you have your hand up again. Yeah, yeah, a couple of things. I mean, in looking for used cars, CarMax is the place that I find them online. Um, they seem, you know, and they will relocate vehicles from all over the state. So anybody looking for a used EV, that's where I would send them, is to CarMax's website. That's one. To uh, to row, um, there has been there's people with multiple cars listed on Toro here in Santa Rosa, so it, it and I had listed mine, but I I don't have it on anymore. How do you spell that? I'm not... Use of peer-to-peer uh, -peer car share. What's what's the name again? Uh, it's Turo, T U R O, right? Oh, okay. Is that right, Brad? Yeah. Um. Right, and peer-to-peer and -peer car share, obviously, um, I, I mean, it's not hour by hour. That's the difference uh, with the the commercial car shares. You know, you could get the car for a matter of hours, and basically peer-to-peer -peer is any I've seen has been uh, by the day. But I have looked at it. I mean, there are people with Model S's. Uh, uh, it's a viable thing to peer-to-peer uh, -peer rent a, a Tesla to do a long-range trip with, you know, and, and that uh, then allows you to own your own shorter-range vehicle, and if you need a long-range, and yeah. I mean, Alan couldn't believe it when I was telling him, look, there's people renting Model S's for less than $100 a day. Uh, wow. And so, yeah. And, and there are multiples here in in the Bay Area who any airport they will they will make the car available from Santa Rosa to San Jose at the airport. Uh, and and I, I've never met any of these people, but if you look at Toro, you will find a lot of uh, Teslas that are available for peer to peer rental. And John, jump in there. Good. Yeah, thanks. It's been good to uh, listen to what you were saying, Tanya. Um, one of the questions I had, well, well, first I was just going to comment about these used cars. Just keep in mind that dealers at the end of leasebacks, uh, you know, kind of throw their cars over to auctions. So if you have a dismantler's license, I think you can go to auctions and get uh, the dealer, uh, you know, the X leases. Um, it's just something to think about, Bruce. I don't know. Um, but the other thing uh, for you, Tanya, is uh, about carbon sequestration. Um, I'm curious on that first graph where you know you had your plans for the future and 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 sequestering carbon was uh, important. I'm curious two things. One, uh, how is that going to be done? And wh what what are some of the typical methods? And also, um, what was being done before? Because there was no nothing registered in the past. And I'm just thinking, if you're going to look in the future, then it seems to make sense to kind of know how we're sequestering in the past to see how we're improving. Hmm. So, anyway, those ideas. Those are great questions. So in our 2020 climate action plan, there were a number of strategies related to carbon sequestration, actually very similar to what we're looking at now, but they were never fully implemented. And, we, and at the time, um, and I don't know if this was a funding or a timeline um, issue, but there wasn't a lot of uh, quantification that was done around those measures in terms of if we implemented these, how much would they reduce our, um, or how much uh, carbon would they sequester? Mm -hmm. So you know, now one of the, the near-term things that we need to do is working with the experts in the field is really figure out how to quantify um, both current efforts and you know what's going to be required to meet that green bar in terms of the amount sequestered. Um, so the, kind of the quantification and measuring is something that needs to be worked on, uh, but we do have resources, um, you know, here in Sonoma County as well as regionally to, to help with that. Uh, but in terms of practices, it's really, it's, it's expanding the use of, of the carbon farm plan, which is something that the RCDs, our resource conservation districts, have the staff and the tools um, and the kind of menu of practices that farms can implement, as, as an example, um, like the composting, the no-till farming, um, planting hedgerows, and I'm sure there's many that I'm not aware of or thinking of at this point, uh, but all ways of increasing the health of the soil um, and, and practices that can be implemented uh, in those 
uh, farms, and then also looking at bringing those practices into the more urban space. And that's an area where I don't think there's been much of any quantification in terms of, you know, if the city of Santa Rosa, for example, started putting these practices into place on its city owned parcels and parks, what impact would that have? Um, so that's another area that needs to be uh, explored further. So I don't know if I answer your whole question. Yeah. But, um, well, I, uh, partly, obviously, there's a, a lot of work to be done. One of the things I wondered about, though, is with the, uh, you know, with all of our local fires, um, you know, we're losing a lot of natural sequestration. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, for one, is there is is part of the plan to reforest, or is is that just risking more fires in the future? And, you yeah, know, sure. more plants you around the cities, do you get more fire danger, et cetera? And so. Yeah. No, that's that's a great question, and it's one that I think. Primarily, the county of Sonoma is going to be working on and looking at. Um, they have a new, in fact, they've just provided some funding for vegetation management programs, and they're um, staffing up as we speak a new climate team within the county. Um, and I think this will be one of the areas they really need to look at is that balance between, you know, protecting our existing carbon stocks and the trees and the landscapes, and then you know doing what needs to be done to mitigate uh, and prevent, you know, do what we can to prevent future fires. So it's a real um, I think it's a challenging area. There's different perspectives on the best way to address that, uh, but I, I think that'll happen at the county level. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm on there. I'm oh. still talking. Or... Yeah, no, go I, ahead. You can go ahead. And jump yeah. Um, I'm wondering whether we need to do a reality check around this uh, sequestration. Uh, and certainly, and you can do an in-depth calculation that maybe start with uh, just very simple things like, um, suppose we use all the acreage in, in, in wine, in grapes for mm -hmm. sequestration. What would that require uh, uh, for each acre to take in for that particular uh, target that we have, right? Mm -hmm. So we can we can do these simple calculations and start at that end what what would we need to do if we did that um and and be aware that this is something we have to do every year right this is a flow a carbon flow that we're trying to take out of the air because we put it in the air it has to be done every year it's not like how much carbon we have to sequester uh, and keep sequestered. We have to put that in every year. So there's probably a natural limit to how much you can sequester in a in a piece of land. Um, so this strategy obviously would not work uh, in, uh, in in the future, uh, in, because at some point you would lose the capacity to sequester more carbon in, in agricultural land. It would go down at least. Yeah. So. I think we're a bit misleading ourselves. That's kind of my feeling around this, that we can take a car, take uh, this carbon that we're not sequestering in the zero target, um, that, we, that we're still emitting in the zero target, that we can take care of it by sequestering. It just feels a bit off to me. Mm. Uh, and I think these simple calculations um, how much land we have, but we need to know if the, all the land was like available for this. But would that just take per acre to sequester? That's well, it, it'll be interesting once uh, the group has uh, ratios to recognize all of that and, and multiply that across the. Mm -hmm. There are re, there are reports that talk about that what we can do with our is limited compared to how much we've released so far. Um, so, okay. Um, we're coming towards the end of the time, and I want to thank you, Tanya. You got a lot of discussion. Yeah, um, it's great. It'd, it'd be great to have uh, a more, and uh, and uh, we're a resource. As I, I liked Sonia's question, it was a it was a great question, uh, and we keep probing. And you know, what can we do as a club to help more? Because we do think things are changing rapidly. We'd like to see it happen even faster. Yep. Absolutely. And I'd be happy to come back at some point in the future where we have okay. you know, made some progress and give you an update and, and get additional feedback. And certainly That'd anytime, great. you know, feel free to reach out to me if you have other. All right, gang. As usual, a few handy links. We'll probably get some other links if you see videos or whatever else that 
have been interesting uh, and probing, um, send them in uh, to the NBA team and we'll include them in the next presentation. Uh, next time, uh, unless we get another speaker, I'll be talking about what the uh, CARB Advanced Clean uh, Cars Workshop reported, which was really quite intriguing. I think there's another workshop this month before I'd actually report out on that. And I was really impressed with the quality and the competence of the CARB team that's working on, on clean cars and, and clean autos. Uh, they really are looking at second order and third order effects and... Uh, uh, it was really interesting listening to it. And they're soliciting uh, input. So if you ever uh, see those meetings, jump in, join in. I've got a lot of response back from them from the things that I sent in. I was surprised. Even two, three days later, I got emails back asking, probing questions about ideas I might have sent in. Um, so they're a very interactive group and doing a lot of analysis. And with that, it's the, oh, John, you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I just, I know I mentioned earlier that Thunderstruck Motors, where we've had meetings in the past before the COVID thing, um, is Brian and I have talked about it, and it seems like we're willing to have meetings there again. If, But I also want to just kind of go over with people where their comfort level is for public meetings and uh, if there would be any requirements or, or hopes that they would have if we did that again. My personal hope would be that we could um, meet kind of in an open, you know, a big open shop doorway and in a way so that there can be people outside and inside if they want uh, to keep the air, you know, flowing and uh, to allow people to encourage people to wear masks if they still feel like they need to for whatever reason, um, if, whether it be they're not vaccinated or if they're just aware of the, the Delta variant coming back, <laughs> which is my current uh, consciousness. Um, so, but, so John, wh why don't you and I do this? We'll construct an email so we get to the larger group of 140 people uh, about the issues and solicit input back okay, from that's them. Okay, that's good, because I, I okay. really want to respond to people's input uh, about yeah. what they need. Yeah, so we'll get to everybody then. And then I, I, I wanted to talk to you anyway about how we might set things up so we continue to have our Zoom component for those members who don't want to show in person. And quite frankly, we now are getting members uh, from different parts yeah. of the country and different parts of the world that actually join in on the North Bay EAA. And yeah. uh, I don't think they want to stop. Well, and, so we'll and let's keep on the table the idea that we don't go in person, that we stay this way. I no, know. no, I need the donuts. <laughs> you need All right, donuts. everybody. Thanks a lot. And uh, see you again next month on okay. August 13th. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.